we'll move on to the next session and the next session is on master videos so we'll get to see some very nice videos from the masters themselves and we we have the chairpersons for the session already in there so i would like to invite dr ashish vashisht who is the head of robotics and general surgery at max saket hospital in delhi we'll move on to the dr. next Amit session who is professor and of the at next ESD. session is on master videos from sir gangaram hospital and was the prosthetic and bariatric surgeon uh, thank you dr vivek so uh, without wasting any time i would like to invite first speaker of this session dr biju chandran he will be speaking uh, on robotic donor hepatectomy he is a surgical renowned surgical gastroenterologist and uh, currently he is working at uh, amrita koch institute in the department of surgical gastroenterology and liver transplantation and their center has done the maximum number of robotic donor hepatectomy in this uh, part of the globe so i invite uh, dr biju chandran to start his talk Uh, hi. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, thank you for the kind invitation. I thank the organizing team for inviting me for this master video session. So um, I'm just sharing my screen once. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm I'm straight away starting with the video because it's only a ten minutes video. It's a six hour surgery which is cut short into ten minutes. Yeah. 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 So we are. I'm just sharing our experience of over. We have done almost around 140 uh, robotic donor hepatectomy. So to start with, this is how we position the patient: 30 degree reverse Trendelenburg and 10 degrees right up. And straight away, um, after taking off the falciform ligament, we come to the groove of the right hepatic vein and the IVC. You can see the right IV. Uh, we are marking the groove of the right hepatic vein and the IVC. initially itself so that we don't have to go back there later on and then the dissection it's quite important to dissect onto the right side of the right hepatic vein so that uh, you can see that i'm lifting the peritoneal layer gently from the right hepatic vein so that there's no injury of the right hepatic vein and it does not get injured when you mobilize the liver as well and the fourth arm is used to retract the gall bladder and you can see that the gall finger is being used to to give traction on the liver and with the first arm we pull the uh, kidney down and there you can see the division of the right triangular ligament that's again the bare area division down so you can see the bare area being divided and the uh, ivc along with the caudate process of the caudate lobe coming into vision you might encounter those kind of inferior hepatic vein so you need to see if it's reconstructable or not this seems to be a very small vein so we are just going to clip it and divide it we are not going to reconstruct this on the bench so that's why i'm burning off the side or else we'll put a hemlock and divide it so this bit is quite important because the caudate elevation from the inferior vena cava so you elevate the entire caudate process and uh, cut the caudate so this is again coming to the hilar transection you can see hilar uh, dissection you can see the portal vein so initially you start on the inferior aspect and if you look at this you can see that uh, that's the portal vein that's almost like a type 2 portal vein you can see the anterior sectal branch the posterior sectal and the left portal vein over there i have marked it in blue and uh, sorry yeah so that's the gentle dissection you perform anterior to the portal vein you can see the artery on top of it and the bile duct is further anterior to it You can see there's the ICG phase. This is like a type three B. You can see there is a posterior sectal duct going and joining the common bile duct. So that's again the lower part of the parenchymal transection which I'm marking on to the gallbladder fossa. You can see the bile duct division right there. This is the division of the caudate process which we have to do initially because we do not do the hanging maneuver in robotic surgery. The, again clamping of the inflow structure of the right hepatic artery and the right portal vein you can see the duct on top and you can see the cystic duct being uh, retracted to the towards the left uh, shoulder so again you do the gentle dissection you can see the line of uh, transection being marked the key important point over here is see, uh, you can see that the um, the demarcation is much lateral to it but when we go it's directly the three point you look 
go to the gallbladder for fen directly to the guru you this is the actual line of uh, um, uh, this discoloration which you had seen but we do not go through that because that again increases the time of parenchymal transection and then we use the rubber band retraction technique for a stable retraction and as you know there's no cure on robotics we use this robotoclasia like the kelly classia so we crush the parenchyma and you see that the veins are just left behind so you can see that's a nice segment 4b vein which is again uh, starting of the middle hepatic vein so you see the 4b vein stay on to the left of the vein and uh, you divide it with the hemlock if you think hemlock is not secure you can use a double hemlock or a hemlock along with a metal clip so these veins are just uh, divided and then further when you go you can see the middle hepatic vein so once the middle hepatic vein comes into view we usually take a modified graft with a partial msb you can see that we are looping the middle hepatic vein so in this we are looping it slightly lower down so segment 8 is further up and we'll encounter it a little later you can see that we are looping the middle hepatic vein there and it's quite crucial at this point uh, because middle hepatic vein they're going to use for reconstruction and at the same time on the donor side there shouldn't be any kind of bleeding later on so you put a double hemlock towards the donor side and a single hemlock onto the graft side so this is the advantage in robot you get that stable field and you know you can take your time do your dissection there and uh, everything is under very well under control you'll see that so that's again the second clip that's coming onto the donor side for the safety so that it does not slip because each time the assistant brings in the suction that's a chance that it can hit onto the hemlock and it can slip up so it's quite crucial that you uh, put double hemlock onto the donor side and divide it and following this division we do the uh, we, the next step after a middle hepatic vein is to open up the bile duct because if you divide the bile duct at this stage the advantage being that you do not uh, i mean the liver will open up like a book if you do not divide the bile duct at this stage then it will be quite difficult for you to go more cranially so sometimes you can but if possible after division of middle hepatic vein it's always that we come back to the hilum we uh, make sure that we do a gentle uh, uh, dissection there you can see very nicely over here the left duct and you can see one of the anterior septal duct here the posterior septal duct is coming different and so gentle um, dissection over it because you can see that that's the black marking you can see the division so that's exactly where we need to come down and then you you cut the cut the bile duct in the icg phase the duct is cut using the uh, pot scissor you can see that once you can see that green uh, hue that came that's green, that is the duct you can see that it's going into the left duct and that's again probing of the main duct to make sure and doubly sure that you know you're not cut the left duct or there is no segment 4 duct there and gentle fine suturing of the duct to prevent any kind of bile leak post uh, for the donor which is very important you can see that we suture it with the help of pds 60 fine stitches very gentle stitches and usually uh, it stays very secure and here we got it as a single duct uh, that's the anterior septal duct and the posterior septal is lying separate and divided separate it's quite important to probe it initially to make sure that you are not cutting into the left duct after that you further dissect the hilar plate you see that there is a gentle because you need to make sure there is no more ducts out there sometimes you can encounter two more ducts if you don't have a proper mri and you're not sure about the ducts so if in case you see a small duct like that which could be a crossing hilar duct or a cordate duct then you need to clip it uh, you can clip on the donor side alone and then cut it with the micropods make sure that uh these kind of small bleeding is quite common in that area which usually stops with gentle pressure and then further transection uh, when you proceed forward you encounter the segment 8 vein here we have took the segment 8 vein separately as you have seen uh so the segment 8 vein is again dissected off and hemlocked on either side because again we need to reconstruct the segment 8 vein on the graft and careful division of the segment 8 vein is done this using of this loop for a hanging maneuver is quite useful so that you can find place for placer of the 
MLOG. You can see that once you do that, then the next bit is because we don't we do not have a hanging manual. What we do is if you look at that, there is gentle dissection over the IVC. At the 12 o'clock phase of the IV, at 12 o'clock of the IVC, we generally take the capsule off the IVC, which is quite crucial because in the open technique, we go with the hanging manual. Here we do not hang the liver. So this is what we do: gentle uh, dissection over the IVC. And you can see the dancing IVC, and you can see the right hepatic vein, which is very well separated out and you can see it on a loop so very well suited for uh, stapling now you can see the bag that comes in the korean bag as we call it which uh, we're placing the graft low uh, liver into the bag and you have that rocking movement for that the entire right lobe goes into the liver i mean into the bag then it's time for removal so once everyone is ready Open set is also ready. The right hepatic artery is divided. Gentle division with the help of pots again, so that you do not uh, cause any kind of arterial dissection or the intimal tear. You can see that the artery is nicely being divided. And here, because it's a type two, we have used the uh, stapler. Uh, if not, you can also use a hemlock for division of portal vein. And after that, then we divide the right hepatic vein. This is with the signia, we are dividing the right hepatic vein. Because after that, it's quite crucial that you make sure that there is no IVC narrowing or any kind of compromise on the IVC or even on the graft side, because we need to reconstruct and uh, plumb the right hepatic vein onto the recipient. You can see the makuchi being nicely divided. And you can see that there's a para cable stapling of the makuchi with no compromise on the IVC. If you do not clear that bit, the problem is you might have a problem with narrowing of the IVC. And that's how the liver comes out. It pops out through a uh, phalanstein incision without division of any rectus muscle. You see the liver is being delivered and given. Then you fix the liver onto the falciform back. Make sure that there's no uh, perfect hemostasis. Raise the drain and make sure that uh, uh, there is no leak by placing gum. And that's what you finally give to the patient. So it's a lot of effort and finally this is what we give back to the patient. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Biju. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Arun Prasad has joined us. Yeah, now in the interest of time, uh, uh, we would not be taking any questions at the moment. Dr. Vashisht, are you there? Uh, Dr. Ashish Vashisht? Hi, can I see you? Can I see you? Yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, 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 we did no introduction to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Arun Prashad, but for the uh, delegates, Arun Prashad is a senior consultant and head at Apollo Hospital in Pediatric Robotic and Thoracic Surgery. He is a a accomplished robotic surgeon and one of pioneers in robotic in India, and he is going to present the case on robotic parostomal hernia. So it is over to you, Dr. Arun Prashad. Thank you, Ashish, for the kind words. And let me share my screen. So this is a case of a robotic parostomal hernia, and uh, one of the advantages of doing this robotic is that we are able to actually enter the extra peritoneal plane easily. So you can see that is the patient lying down. Previous APR was done. You can see the stoma bag. The arm has to be brought down a little. The verus needle is being introduced from the right side. And these are the three ports. And you could see the stomal site there. So once we put in the telescope, you can see now these are the three port sites. The robot is being docked from the left side of the patient. And we will be doing a three port technique here. The mesh can be introduced quite easily from the uh, trocar, the camera trocar. So after introducing the three ports, we've gone inside. What you can see there is the parastomal hernia. That's the end colostomy on the right side. You can see there is a little bit of omental adhesions there. The small bowel, which were there inside, 
drops down once the pneumo has been made we have marked the site where we are going to put the do the next to the muscle so all continuously you must see the muscle fibers on the top that means you are in the right recto rectus plane as you can see now as a retro rectus plane and we are now opening the transversus so this is a tar which has to be done in able to close the defect tension free with the articulating scissors and the instruments and you can see how this part of the surgery is fairly simple combined with the steady camera now again the left hand is opening up and you can see the shiny blue peritoneum there that means we are in the right transversus abdominis release plane and this division is done till we reach the stomal site then we are cutting open a button all around the hernia site around the stoma so as to bring down the peritoneum completely so that's the peritoneum being brought down lateral to the hernia so basically what we have done is there is a circle around so that circle defect will be closing now you can see how the colon is going through the peritoneum through the abdominal wall so now the abdominal wall defect above is being sutured so as to reduce the size of the defect and the peritoneum and the sheath are lying at the bottom of the floor as you can see so that is the complete closure being done and after the defect has been closed what we are now doing is suturing the colon laterally so as to close up that space now that space need not be closed but you can see robotically how simple it is to close that space and hence lateralize the colon completely so this and articulating suturing is where it has helped us now we have put in a tape to measure the size of the space which we had created from top to bottom and from side to side now that's the hole in the peritoneum which we had created to bring it down so that hole is now being closed so that hole is closed all around the colon and now we have the abdominal wall repaired on the top the peritoneum and sheath repaired at the bottom and the colon going through the peritoneum through the anterior abdominal wall outside now with lateralizing the colon we are putting the mesh inside the mesh is sutured to the anterior abdominal wall
so this is a simple mesh which we are using proline mesh and after fixing the mesh we close the peritoneal defect so we have avoided any kind of dual mesh we have avoided the use of any staplers thereby bringing the cost of the robotic surgery almost the same as it would have been by laparoscopy using a dual mesh and tackers at the end of the procedure now that is the peritoneum which has been closed from top to bottom so lateral hernias are quite uh, relatively i would say easy to do robotically as compared to midline hernias and the advantage of articulating instrument 3d vision makes it easy for us to technically tackle these kind of parastomal hernias be it ileostomy hernia or a colostomy hernia so i think that's the end of my video okay so thank you dr arun it was really a very nice presentation just there's no question on the box but i'd like to talk to you about it so you are doing a retro rectus repair just for the delegates and all can we do it as a ventral tap repair for a parastomal hernia ventral tap repair extra peritoneum uh, extra no, peritoneum. Tap, tap, tap repair would be tough you know that is the reason why uh, laparoscopically also when the mesh is being placed it's always placed intra peritoneal so the advantage here of the robotic has been to be able to place it extra peritoneally ne but the same thing lateralization and everything i know the flap is going to be thinner but um, half of the flap is still of the peritoneum because lower portion is there is no sheath is only the peritoneum so do you think is the feasibility because many people are doing a tap for a routine uh, midline hernia small hernias and all so just a yes. thought which came in the mind uh, yes it is definitely a possibility but you know i had tried in the past but i could not complete it okay and not many people yeah, are not many people are doing a tap for the parastomal hernias yes they all do so the modified where the mesh is actually entrapped on Uh, which uh, sutures do you normally use to close the defect uh, this was uh, uh, pds which is the stratafix okay well, that's very because it is very sometimes <clears throat> cumbersome to hold the sutures in the initial stages so barb sutures are also very good in yes. this case yes i think barb sutures is what we need to use yeah that is more comfortable for the beginners proline and everything is quite tough to be to use for that thing true so thank you dr arun it was a really an amazing presentation thanks for it and now over to uh, dr daksh uh, thank you dr vashish and thank you dr arun for a wonderful presentation now we move on to the next dr jim khan uh, who is a consultant surgeon at uh, portsmouth hospital university nhs trust and an associate professor anglia ruskin university chelmsford and he'll be talking on robotic tme and uh, dr khan thank you very much uh, i hope you can hear me um a very good afternoon to everybody yes, sir. uh very grateful to professor goel professor bindal and uh, the chairpersons of this session and the organizing committee of this indo uk surgicon congress i was absolutely delighted um to to link in today i hope we can share this and our no time is limited so i'm going to go straight to share my screen there we are and i hope you can just to confirm that you can see my slides yes sir yes sir we thank can. you thank you so much so um i work in portsmouth as you very kindly introduced me i'm a colorectal surgeon my practice is very specialized in robotics and rectal cancers um do very limited colon cancer work but mostly rectal cancer surgery uh, in the uk we have the largest experience of robotic colorectal we adopted this in 2012 and have worked through various uh, platforms as they have evolved so at the present we have two robotics fourth generation uh, x systems in my unit um and we run a fellowship training program for that i was fortunate enough to get trained with bill heald and i think 
for rectal cancer, so you're going to learn TME, you have to remember what is it that really matters. You have to do precise dissection in the embryological planes, uh, remove the intact mesorectum with the lymph nodes and lymphatics, and that will result in a good quality specimen and uh, lo less local recurrence and improved survival for the patients. So we are very methodical. We devise this operation into different modules, and everything is taught um, in, in, in modules to fellows and residents. So I'll take this video through in different parts as to how we do it and what modules we have um, adopted. Um, key is planning the operation with a very good standardized technique. So, so this case is a 60-year-old male with a BMI of 29 with a rectal cancer that you can see the mid-rectal tumor five centimeters from the anal world on the MRI, T3 and 1. So we will have these five modules, um, well, six if you put position docking as well, um, of the whole TME process. So the key learning points in positioning will be to avoid any pressure point injuries to the arms, neck, shoulder, make sure there's no slippage of the patient, and you dock quickly so that that downtime of docking is reduced. Our port placement is quite simple. You draw the line from mid-clavicular to mid and vinyl point, lateralize that line by four centimeters and put four robotic ports on that line, and you need one assistant port, which is gonna be outside that line. These are the three instruments we use as a standard, scissors, bipolar, and a grasper, and then there's a camera. And that's the setup that I would have for my preference, but you can move the camera up or down depending on you like two left hands or two right hands. A few minutes, couple of minutes of initial laparoscopy is very useful to get a bird's eye view of the whole situation. This is the right external iliac artery, and this is the DJ flexure with IMV. The patient is 10 degrees head down and 20 degrees right-sided tilt. And in that position, we keep the patient in one position. It's single docking, totally robotic procedure with docking from the left hip. So you have to have a good view of the pelvis, IMA, and IMV. And if you can see the external iliac artery and the IMV at the top, you have a good exposure. The robot is docked from the left side of the patient. Um, the surgeon can guide the person who is driving the robot. Um, and this process should be fairly quick. It should take no more than 10 minutes of putting the robot in the right position, attaching it to the ports, and putting the right instruments in. Because that's the downtime that you can reduce very quickly um, to proceed to the next stage. The first step will be the vascular dissection. So you're going to start at the sacral promontory, and we look for the IMA and superior rectal artery precisely at that level. You know where the right ureter is, you know where the right iliac vessels are, and then you look for the line of dissection, which is essentially between, between the pedicle and the iliac vessels. Opening the planes at this level allows the surgeon to see the hypogastric nerves quite cleanly. You have the ability of traction and counter traction. My third arm is lifting the sigmoid mesentery up. I have my right and left hands available and I can provide traction, counter traction and adjust. Often we try to push the specimen rather than holding and pulling it. You can see the hypogastric nerve on the floor. You can use a vessel sealing device if you prefer that, but my personal preference is monopolar diathermy. So I will use the scissors, uh, but you can dissect the IMA all the way up, identify the hypogastric nerves, protect them and divide the uh, artery right at its origin from the aorta. The ability of the endorist instruments allow you to go around the vessel quite cleanly um, without any significant bleeding. Uh, and even in fat people, which is a problem in our society in, in the West, I'm sure India is no different, uh, that we have to deal with this high BMI patients. This could uh, make life easier with the endorist instruments and the control that you have with it. I like locking clips on the vessels, just gives an extra piece of uh, mind and piece of security that you don't have to come in out of hours to take a patient back for some unexpected bleeding. So once the artery is divided, we then leave it there and we go for the IMV because in theory, the artery plane is retroperitoneal, IMV is higher up and you have to take that plane higher up under the vein and then you're gonna come down from that and join your IMA plane. And here again, endorist instruments are helping a lot to separate the kidney from the mesocolon. You can see the gyrotas fascia going downwards and mesocolon going upwards. And at this stage, we are ready to join the dissection by dividing the IMV. It is divided higher up under the DJ flexure. And again, I use hemolock clips on the vein, one each, and you can divide it. This allows the length for the colon to reach down. The next module is to learn about chronic mobilization, the anatomy of the ureter and gonadal vessels, 
and how to use the third arm properly to get traction. Because the specimen gets to get lax. You can see the pancreas at the top end of that dissection to the left. And this is the beauty of your laparoscopic or robotic instruments that you can turn left and work over the pancreas. So we use a, a, a infra -pan infracolic suprapancreatic approach to get into the lesser sac. Leaving a tonsil swab over the pancreas can be a good trick. And come laterally, you will see this swab as a marker of where pancreas body and tail is. Before we go laterally, finish the medial dissection on the gonadal vessels and ureter. Um, you can easily see the planes in 3D much better than what you might be seeing in 2D right now. Um, and the surgeon can safely continue from medial to lateral till you start doing the lateral dissection. And that really is very straightforward affair. If you've done enough medial to lateral dissection from below, you only have five or 10% of the dissection to do from the lateral side. And again, your assistant is not really needed in this place because your third arm is lifting or counter correction and you're holding the colon with your own hand. That's the swab at the top end that we left on the pancreas. And you can see the last step in flexion mobilization will be now this detaching the omentum from the transverse colon. And this is exactly as we did in open surgery, very close to the colon using monopolar diathermy, take all that momentum away from you uh, step by step and the whole colon will come down. And then we focus into the pelvis. It's the same port placement. We're just gonna turn the whole focus now into the pelvis. We're gonna start at the back of the rectum uh, with the TME first. And again, leaving a swab in front of the small valve to stop it from coming into your view. You can see the hypogastric nerve on the floor. Um, I'm using a small pledget in my left hand. It's just a nice retraction to lift the specimen up without damaging it. The green thing you saw was the ICG that we inject around the cancer. There's a lymph node deposit at the back, which did take that dye. So I'm guided to stay clear of that node, which is closed and threatening the margin. This patient has not been downstaged with any chemo radiation. And that's the beauty that you can see the planes quite nicely. It's a loose areolar plane, the holy plane, the TME plane that you can carry on working at the back as low as you can safely progress. Uh, with chemo radiation, we often see the scarring and edema, which makes the planes a little bit harder, but they are still visible. Now this is the right lateral side. After you've done enough at the back, you come to the right. You can see the right hypogastric nerve in the background, uh, but you try to save it as much as you can, of course. You have to operate within the, those two hypogastric nerves. Um, and then we're going to go to the left side now to release the left lateral side wall uh, so that the rectum can come out of the true pelvis. The left hypogastric nerve is seen on the side here. And again, you're operating just within that nerve to release it and keeping that specimen intact. The front dissection, you can see we have stopped at the right and the left at equal planes. We're going to go at the front now, marking the line of my dissection a centimeter above that peritoneal reflection and then join those dots. Here the beauty of the robotic platforms come in because you have that 3D view and you have that 30 up camera with the third arm retracting the seminal vesicles up and I can work in front of that in non fascia. This is a trick we use often which is putting a needle through the abdominal wall straight stitch to hitch the bladder or the uterus upwards. You can see the non valueous fascia is two layers. You can operate within the two layers of the fascia, uh, depending on your tumor location. But at this point, the dissection goes round and round in circles. So you go at the back, do a little bit there. You go on the sides, do a little bit there, uh, and then do at the front. At the back, you have this option of obviously going 30 up with this camera, and you can release the posterior midline refi to allow yeah. for the stapling to happen. So your time is almost up. Sorry, the video was nine and a half minutes. I'm not sure how I managed to overrun, but if you say so, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jim. Now I'd like to call upon Dr. Uh, S.P. Somoshekar. Uh, he's the chairman and HOD Surgical Oncology, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. And he'll be talking about robotic D2 gastrectomy. Hmm? Dr. Somoshekar. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much. Uh, it's exactly 10 minute video I'm starting now. Uh, so this is to show how to do a D2 uh, lymph node uh, dissection and a total radical gastrectomy 
this is a very important thing uh, that you need to keep uh, the arm two between four centimeter at the midpoint of camera and R1. Otherwise, uh, it's very tough to do a proper D2. Uh, this is how the robot, which is docked from the head end, which has come. This is from a robot X, which is being done. Systematically, we go and do D2 lymph node dissection. And uh, I don't use another port or this one. I just put this and this lifts the entire liver. So I use it in every case. So liver is automatically lifted by this Versa band. A hook goes and hooks itself into the right crust. I first open the hepatoduodenal ligament and I look if there is any accessory hepatic artery which is present in 20% of the time coming from the left gastric. Once you do this, straight I go down to the right crust of the diaphragm and take the station one and open the right truss of the diaphragm, make an entry into the hiatus, keeping pharyngoesophageal membrane. Robotic hook is most important in this. So station one, two, three is cleared. By doing this, I would also look if there is acid hepatic. While doing this, be very careful that you are not close to uh, the caudate lobe and the vena cava. Hook is an instrument I strongly recommend to do this. And this is a case which is uh, a type three a G junction tumor. So if you see, I take a good amount of margin and a diaphragm cross around that. So the beauty of the uh, hook is you can do a reverse sweeping technique. So the, do the tough part first. Don't start doing a gastrectomy first. So lesser momentum, hepatodon ligament, acid hepatic. Now you can see that I expose the right crust. Once I do the crust, I run along the right crust, go down until I go into the celiac. Then anterior pleura and peritoneal reflection I take off. And during this time, you would encounter the vagus. If you are not going to do a high hour Lewis, I recommend to cut the vagus at this moment. Now I am at the left crust. So once you're at the left crust, little bit of left crust you cut so that you, know, you can have a pull up the jejunum later you do. Now I always tend to cut the cardiophrenic uh, ligament and the fundus and the first two short guys is right away here. So you can see that I go and keeping a watch on the inferior phrenic vessel, I go ahead and clear this. So I have lifted the whole esophagus, right crust, left crust is done. I go down into the thorax until the inferior pulmonary ligament so the anastomosis is tension free. And I also take the lower cardiophrenic ligament. You can see the whole margin completely mobilized esophagus, G junction, fat and a part of diaphragm. I always strongly recommend that you take the first two short gastric vessel, create two leaf, only take the anterior leaf. Posterior leaf would have the splenic vessels. If you injure them, you'll have a polar necrosis or infarct of the spleen. So you can see that I open and take first two short gastrics right away. So I go, went into the hepatodural ligament, look for acid hepatic, station one, two, three is clear. Then I cut the right crust, left crust. I go down straight until I see the inferior pulmonary ligament. And then I cut the ligament between the diaphragm and then the fundus of the stomach. Now what I do is I will first do a D2 lymph node dissection completely systematically before I actually address the momentum and mobilization of the stomach. You can see we take the first cut on the pancreatic capsule with the hook in a reverse sweep. So you go and address station seven. So reverse case. So once you see the station seven, fully skeletonize and expose the hepatic artery. So if you do a systematic D2 lymph node dissection first, then the rest part is very easy. You can see that now station seven and 18 is clear. Then I go down straight away into station seven to the hepatic. So you can see the hepatic artery is fully skeletonized. Entire nodal bundle is in one packet. I cut the anterior capsule of the pancreas up to the splenic hilum. So that station 11, 12 is removed. So now with the reverse sweeping, you go and take off all the hepatic artery nodes. So you can see that station nine is being clear. I go down until I see the hepatic artery dividing into right and left. And then also you would see hepatic artery proper, GDA, and then the right gastric coming. So while doing this particular area, you can go behind actually the uh, you know hepatic artery. So hepatic artery proper, that is a portal vein which is exposed. So as you do uh, dissection of the hepatic artery, you would go posterior to the hepatic artery and you will expose the portal vein. So you must be quite careful to do that. So you can see that unless you want to do D3, we stop at the hilum of the liver. So I have used a vessel scenery in the left hand, fenestrated bipolar in the third arm and a hook with monopolar. So this would complete that part of the dissection. Now the anterior pancreatic capsule cut is going into the celiac 
plexus. So as I go to the spleniac, celiac plexus, I take station nine. So by taking station nine, then you would see the you know coronary vein, there are the left gastric vein and gastric artery. You can see that, and I go on to expose the splenic artery. So staying close to the pancreatic capsule, taking the pancreatic capsule actually helps. So you can see this is very important to do. Otherwise, you will end up leaving station 11 and 12 lymph nodes there. So now the celiac trunk is fully exposed. Anterior layer of the pancreatic fascia is cut there. So the endorist technology of the robot and the hook helps you to go around the entire celiac plexus. See this? So all the fiber of fatty here, you should never do a blunt dissection, sharp dissection. Otherwise, you will end up leaving the celiac uh, you know, lymph node there. So you can see I went around there. Now I take a small part of, you know, station one and three nodes so that the crust is. So now celiac plexus, hepatic artery, splenic and left gastric is there. I have already taken the coronary vein from the vessel sealer. Now I clip it, one clip to the celiac trunk to the left gastric artery. Now the entire area is done. Now continue this particular dissection along the entry capsule over the splenic artery and splenic vein until you go to the splenic hilum. And since I have already done most of the dissection from below and cut the, you know, uh, phrenic ligament, it is very easy to do it. Now you start doing a systematic supracolic total omentectomy. You expose the colon and go close to the colon and take it. Once you expose, you make an entry on the left side, it's quite easy to go ahead with the vessel sealer. Five cuts, you are already there. See the beauty of finishing the left side dissection. I already reached there. Now I would address my concentration to station six. That is a subpyloric lymph node. And you start taking the capsule of the pancreas so that the omental bursectomy happens and communicate it until you see the right gastric. So once you do this, station four, five, six, seven is cleared. And since I have a vessel sealer, I don't put any clip here. So I would take the right gastrovic artery and vein straight away with a vessel sealer. And then the station six nodes is removed. This is very important because this prepares actually the junction between the D1, D2 to transect and transect the duodenum to prepare it to staple it out. And the beauty is, you know, if you do D2 lymph node dissection first, then it's very easy to reach this particular area. You can see there's a pylorus, pre-pyloric vein of Mayo. Then I will take the last bit of the omental attachment between the gallbladder and the calyx, and then the duodenal junction. This also helps you to complete a very, very nice cockerization. So you can see that I have skeletonized the junction between D1 and D2, and I've lifted that is the head of the pancreas, and uh, GDA is exposed there, and I take this part of the tissue so that you know I have a tension free stapling. So preparing to fire the stapler. So preparing the D1, D2 junction, little bit of work if you do here, then you know always the stapling comes very well and even you can take a second layer of Lambert on the D1 junction when you transect. So once you do that, you can see I lifted off the duodenum. So that is a D2. Now here comes the stapler. So you can see that at the junction of D1 and D2, leaving about five millimeter margin from the head of pancreas. So all the... So now I staple and make sure you tell the anesthetist to withdraw the rice tube or remove it off completely. Since I do uh, a transoral Orville stapler, I withdraw the rice tube completely. So the staple comes through the transoral loop for me to do. You can see it is completely resected. Now the whole stomach is pulled up. Now I take a stay suture at the esophagus. I take five centimeter above. So I include about two inch of esophagus along with my specimen. Always take a stay suture because the moment you traffic the uh, esophagus, the esophagus would go back to the right. In inferior pound stapled. So now the whole specimen is removed and out. I bag it and I remove it to a small. Wound. You can see that that the esophageal stump which is transected and it has gone. Entire D2 is done. Now I tell my anesthetist to pass an orville. So I put a very small wound guard, protect it about three to four centimeter incision and the whole specimen is retrieved. Now the anesthetist passes the stapler through the oral cavity and I would pass it, bring it out through esophagus and I do a esophagus jejunostomy and jejuno jejuno putting a wound guard and putting a gloves and it's going to be a retrocolic reconstruction which can be done. Alternatively, you can do side to side with stapler but I always do with transoral stapler. So Ruin by esophagus, jejunostomy with Orville and then JJ.
thank you very much that completes my time video in the given time thank you uh -huh. thank you so much dr somashekar for a wonderful video presentation uh, are there any questions Uh, okay, so now uh, I would like to hand over to Dr. Vivek Bindal for the next session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to my uh, co chairperson. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would like to thank all the chairpersons and uh, speakers for this wonderful session. I, we enjoyed the videos by Dr. Jim Khan and Dr. Somashekhar, Dr. Arun Prasad. So they were they were actually very good. So uh, in the 